Okay, I want to welcome everyone to the American Probation and Parole Association's webinar. Uh, the title of it is, Is It Reasonable? A Legal Review of Warrantless Searches of Probationers and Parolees. My name is Adam Matz. I'm a research associate with APPA. I've been there since 2009. Uh, I previously worked for the Kentucky Court of Justice, and I'm also a doctoral candidate at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. I have two uh, additional individuals on this particular project uh, that I want to briefly introduce. Uh, first is Dr. Craig Hemmins. Uh, he is the department chair and professor in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology at Washington State University. He holds a Juris Doctorate from North Carolina Central University School of Law and a PhD in Criminal Justice from Sam Houston State University. Uh, professor Hemmins has published 19 books and more than 100 articles on a variety of criminal justice related topics. His primary research interests are legal issues in criminal justice. He has served as president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences, um, known short as ACJS, uh, and as the editor of the Journal of Criminal Justice Education. His publications have appeared in Justice Quarterly, Crime and Delinquency, uh, Criminal Law Bulletin, Prison Journal, Federal Probation, and even APPA's own perspectives. Uh, I also want to introduce uh, Mr. John Turner. Unfortunately, he's not able to join us today on the webinar uh, for other issues, but um, we want to go ahead and recognize uh, his contributions to the work that we're going to be presenting here. Uh, Mr. Turner is a PhD student and a teaching assistant in the Department of Criminal Justice and Criminology at Washington State University. He holds a Master of Science in criminology from Indiana State University, uh, and he has published in the Encyclopedia of Community Corrections. Uh, his primary research interests are legal issues, uh, offender rehabilitation, and legalization and implementation of recreational marijuana. Please note the webinar is being recorded. Uh, it will be made available through the APPA website and also APPA's PSN dedicated website in the future. Uh, contact information will be provided at the end if you'd like a, to follow up with the presenters or if you'd like to obtain a copy of the PowerPoint slides. Uh, there will be an opportunity for the presenters to address questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, if you could please make any, pose any questions that you may have, uh, do so through the chat function on GoToWebinar, and then we will compile those and answer as many of those as we can at the end. Finally, we want to thank the Bureau of Justice Assistance uh, of the Department of Justice for their support of this training uh, through the Project Safe Neighborhoods Anti-Gun and, and Gang Initiatives. We will begin by briefly discussing PSN, the objectives of the webinar, and a brief overview, overview of police probation and parole partnerships. Uh, Dr. Hemmins will follow up with an overview of their research concerning legal parameters of searches of probationers and parolees. Um, the webinar We'll conclude with a Q&A, so again, feel free to insert any sort of questions that you may have uh, during the presentation in the chat section, and we will do our best to address as many of those as we can. I want to give a very brief overview of Project Safe Neighborhoods, uh, because that's really what's made this webinar possible and a lot of other products that APPA has been developing uh, as it pertains to PSN. Um, PSN was formed in 2001. It is a nationwide initiative aimed at the reduction of gun and gang violence. Uh, it's heavily influenced by programs such as CompStat, Operation Ceasefire, and Exile. Uh, it was originally aimed mostly at a anti-gun, sort of gun violence uh, focus, but it's shifted to uh, predominantly a gang focus with the guns still a heavy influence, still a heavy part of it uh, as it pertains to uh, gang violence. Now, PSN is administered by the 94 U.S. District Attorney's Offices. Uh, APPA is one of many partners who are authorized to provide PSN training and technical assistance. Uh, today's webinar specifically concerns warrantless searches of probationers and parolees, uh, especially as it relates to police probation and parole partnerships. One of the primary components of PSN is the promotion of collaborations or partnerships. So you can see where this ties into the overarching mission of PSN uh, specifically. 
just to kind of give a quick uh, introduction to how this webinar is sort of focused, um, this webinar really concerns the limited Fourth Amendment rights of probationers and parolees and the implications of probation parole status on the search of such individuals uh, by probation, parole, and law enforcement officers. One of the most common conditions of supervision includes a waiver of the right to refuse consent to warrantless searches by probation or parole officers. I think we're all very familiar with that. Uh, in some jurisdictions, however, uh, this provision is extended to law enforcement, uh, which enables police to conduct warrantless searches of these probationers and parolees. Uh, in the case of U.S. v. Knights 2001, for example, the Supreme Court upheld the warrantless search of a probationer's home by a police detective on the basis of reasonable suspicion, which is a lower burden of proof than probable cause, uh, which is typically reserved for free citizens. In Sampson v. California 2006, the Supreme Court further reiterated that the Fourth Amendment protection against searches does not apply to parolees known to law enforcement officers, requiring even less grounds uh, than a reasonable suspicion. Uh, while some have provided a federal review of relevant case law, uh, such as Stanley Alderman, uh, Colbridge, uh, in terms of Texas Project Spotlight, uh, there previously really hadn't been a comprehensive overview uh, concerning state or local case law, uh, particularly its implications for a given jurisdiction. Uh, initially, I'm going to be discussing police and probation partnerships, um, and then we'll kind of go into more focus on the legal aspects. I do want to mention that there was a webinar conducted last year, uh, which was with Dr. Kim and Tom Williams from CSOSA, uh, as well as myself. So if you're interested in more on Project uh, Police Probation and Parole Partnerships specifically, feel free to check out that recording. It's available on the APPA website and also our PSM website. We have four general overarching uh, objectives for this webinar. It's primarily to define police probation and parole partnerships, more or less to uh, talk about what they are, how they came about, what's influenced them, uh, what's some of the uh, areas of focus that they're, they're particularly used for, and then also what kind of research surrounds them, what works uh, in particular. Then we're going to outline federal case law as well as state, local case law, which is where most of our research has been for this particular uh, topic. And then at the end, we'll summarize some implications for actual practice in terms of how that influences perhaps how folks engage in these partnerships. Some may ask, you know, why, why should we care about probationers and parolees in terms of law enforcement's avail ability to search them? Um, and the answer is quite simple. Uh, it's because we know recidivism is a problem. We know it's a problem in our field. And we know it's especially a problem in large urban cities. Uh, you know, for example, according to a study of four California cities conducted by the Justice Center recently, uh, including Los Angeles, which is pictured here, one in five arrests, or about 20 percent, involve individuals under probation or parole supervision. Uh, more specifically, that's one in six for violent crimes and one in three for drug arrest. Uh, in addition to that, we know from a wealth of past literature, uh, particularly from Anthony Braga, David Kennedy, Andrew Papacristo, uh, and, and many more, that often in excess of 50% of homicide offenders and, and even victims, uh, often gang affiliated, uh, in large cities such as Boston, Chicago, Los Angeles, found to be under probation or parole supervision at the time of the crime. Uh, so we know this is a, a issue and a lot of crimes, a lot of serious crimes in major urban cities are being perpetuated by probationers or parolees who are under supervision or in, in some cases, uh, probationers or parolees who are actually, actually the victims of the crimes. So the, the pro proposed solution really that's been really put forth or put out there uh, really came about late 90s. Uh, and this really comes from David Kennedy. And it's this idea of uh, pulling levers, um, which is this notion that justice agencies, they, they know who the most dangerous individuals in the community are. 
but what's lacking is this proper communication uh, to best utilize this information and prevent these sort of crimes from occurring. In other words, police and probation or parole or other agencies uh, aren't quite communicating efficiently effect and effectively uh, to better address and, and sort of uh, supervise these individuals. And so that's really what kind of promoted a lot of these collaborations that we've seen come together since the late 90s. Um, you know, some folks might wonder, why didn't this happen sooner? What, what was going on? And really a reasonable reason, reasonable response to that would be simply that justice agencies, they're just known for being inserted, for being somewhat isolated. Um, and so there just wasn't that, that mind to really be engaged in collaboration. It's very, um, very isolated. You can contribute a lot of the partnership opportunities to really an, an ideological shift in policing from paramilitar the paramilitaristic style of policing, uh, which really is still prevalent today, to what's really become kind of community policing back in the mid, mid late 90s. Uh, now it's not just that ideological shift too, but obviously there's a funding component too. There's a lot of funding that was dropped in to support community policing, which encouraged uh, more collaboration in the community. And so that really provided kind of the genesis, the opportunity for these partnerships to develop. Uh, specifically formal partnerships to develop. It's important to note that there's always been informal partnerships between police and individual probation pro officers. Uh, but what we're really talking about here is those formalized partnerships uh, with very specific MOUs and uh, uh, meetings, et cetera. Now, it really all originates with Boston's Operation Nightlight, which folks are probably very familiar with, came about in 1992. And it was a chance encounter between law enforcement officers and probation and parole officers at the court, who basically realized, uh, you know, hey, we're, we're supervising uh, and you're arresting the same people. Uh, let's get together, let's work together, and, and see if we can't improve uh, our efficiency. There was some work, uh, a little bit of research done in the late 90s that kind of helped support that, uh, that helps kind of promote it, and it became really popular. It was really hailed as a success, uh, and that really led to a lot of replications throughout the country. Uh, in addition to the sort of practical side of it, uh, folks who are kind of maybe into criminological theory, they could think of this in terms of a variety of different uh, theoretical uh, positions. And so you could integrate a variety of different positions, including uh, classical theory, differential association, life course, uh, conservative theories, and subcultural theories. And just kind of real quickly give you some ideas. If you think about uh, rational choice, you can think of target hardening uh, or visibility. So uh, you know, uh, deterrence, you can think about exile, media outreach. Uh, routine activities really plays into this idea that you know, probations and parolees are both perpetrators and victims, which is this idea that they're in proximity um, to where violence is. So sort of a geographic hotspot kind of uh, issue where they're in, a, in an environment where crime is a problem. And so that makes them just as likely to be a victim as a perpetrator, perhaps. Differential association, everyone probably knows. Obviously, uh, if we're talking about gang behaviors, peer associations are very important. Uh, life course theories in particular, what's kind of interesting is pulling lever strategy really is an applied version of, of life course in the sense that what we're talking about with that is you have life course persistent uh, offenders and then you have adolescent limited. And the idea of pulling levers is to get everyone to talk, get everyone together and identify those life course persistent folks, the folks who are high risk to keep reoffending, to keep posing problems. I uh, really don't want to mess with those adolescent limited, the folks who desist, you know, once they get past, you know, adolescent or young adulthood. really want to focus on those, those folks who are really posing a continued problem, you know, through criminal histories and anything else. Uh, and so that's really closely tied to the idea of pulling levers. Uh, conservative theories, folks who will obviously be familiar with broken windows. And then subcultural theories, just want to make one note. Um, subcultural theories really focus on gang behaviors and uh, the idea of perhaps subcultures, and sometimes you can have countercultures uh, in terms of the motivation for gangs. So uh, when you get certain cultures that might be a counterculture, they don't want to accept the morals, they have different expectations, uh, which maybe makes it more difficult for them to desist or uh, be reintegrated uh, into sort of a conventional uh, 
society or conform. I want to briefly kind of go through the different typologies as well for the different types of partnerships that you'll encounter. Now, on this slide, you'll see there's four or five different types of uh, partnerships. Now, these aren't mutually exclusive partnerships uh, uh, types. These actually overlap quite a bit. For example, information sharing may be integrated into every single type of these um, types of partnerships. Now, information sharing can exist independent as well. Uh, just to kind of briefly define each one, um, enhanced supervision really refers to face-to-face -face contact. It's on the ground. Police officers, probation officers are working together. Physically, they're in the same place. They're doing joint patrols. They're doing home visits together. Uh, and they're you know, visiting, uh, you know, talking to the probation or parolee. So there's face-to-face -face contact. Uh, and the idea is that that's increased level of surveillance, increased level of supervision. Uh, there's a lot of examples of that. These are talked about a lot in the literature. You uh, obviously are probably familiar with Nightlight, but there's also uh, San Bernardino's Nightlight. There's Project Spotlight in Texas. Uh, there's what C. Sosa calls accountability tours. And then there's also the Juvenile Violence Reduction Partnership in Philadelphia, and, and many more. Uh, Fugitive apprehension, I believe everybody would be very familiar with. Um, simply probation or parole absconds, then you know it, a warrant is issued, probation and parole works with law enforcement to try to bring those folks back in. Uh, an example of that would be parole at large, uh, which is called PAL in California. Information sharing uh, is a very broad uh, category. It can be local, so it could just be officers getting together in a meeting and sharing information just verbally. Uh, which is what happens in the case of YVRP is they have regular meetings and they just run through a checklist and they share information. Uh, but it can also be broader than that. It can be between states. It could be uh, even national. And, and APPA has been involved in a national information exchange between the Interstate Compact for Adult Offender Supervision and the state fusion centers. Uh, and the intent of that being that potentially dangerous state transfers uh, then a notification goes to state fusion centers, and then the state fusion centers are able to notify local law enforcement. So that's an example of a purely information sharing exchange. Uh, specialized enforcement is just really can involve the other ones, but it focuses on gangs or sex offenders, for example. And the interagency problem solving is really what PSN is. Project Safe Neighborhoods is designed to be interagency problem solving uh, initiative. So it brings together more than just police probation, but you know, community organizations, faith-based organizations, uh, prosecutors, courts, so on. There are a variety of, of benefits, and there are also some uh, problems that have been talked about quite a bit in the literature. Uh, first, the benefits, um, particularly improving officer safety seems to be the biggest one when it comes to benefit. You're not only improving the safety of the probation or parole officer, particularly if they're not armed uh, and they're going into uh, you know, gang members' uh, homes, but you're improving the uh, safety of the law enforcement officer when, when that individual is out on the street doing their patrols, they're more aware of you know, who's under supervision and they can take action and they can also communicate with the probation or parole officer if someone's violating curfew, uh, so on. And, and there's an example in Florida where law enforcement if they observe a violation, uh, they will give the individual, the probation or parolee, a, a notice, and then they'll communicate back to the probation or parole officer who will then follow up on that. Uh, we already talked about information sharing. That's a big one. Uh, it's pretty much natural if you're partnering and sharing information. Uh, the street presence, it, it not only works for the safety officer, but it also just increases a sense of accountability. And there, there is some anecdotal information that tends to imply that probationers or police will take their supervision more seriously when they know police are aware of, of their supervision. Or if they're in the, you know, if they do a home visit with the probationer or parole, uh, parole officer, that kind of wakes the uh, probationer or parolee up. And then a final benefit which is really assertive, but it's really not substantiated yet, is this idea of crime reduction. And, and I'll cover that a little bit uh, in the next slide, actually. Uh, a few problems I want to highlight, though. Uh, first one is stalking horse incidents. 
Uh, that came from the Supreme Court, and the idea there is that police officers may abuse the partnership, and they may use it to get access to the, the uh, probationers or parolees and, and basically harass them or, as the term says, stalk them. Uh, so there's a limit to how far you want to go with this, uh, but there's no real documented cases of where this is really an issue, uh, but it, it has been talked about and discussed a little bit. Uh, increased offender monitoring can also occur. That's a double-edged sword. It's good on one, one side and bad on the other. Uh, it's good in the sense of accountability, but it's bad, uh, particularly if it's mostly just technical violations, uh, because then you're just increasing sort of that revolving door, uh, perhaps. So it's a fine balance there. And then there's several more organizational uh, note uh, variables to note. Uh, turfism, mission distortion, mission creep, and organizational lag. And real briefly, turfism is simply that perhaps organizations have trouble partnering because they have their own turf, they want to protect it, or for example, uh, they're competing for funding, um, which is lucrative, it's difficult to get. Uh, any more federal grants want folks to partner before they do proposals, so Actually, that probably encourages more collaboration uh, and help, helps work against this idea of turfism. Mission distortion is the idea that probation and parole uh, has to balance, obviously, surveillance and, and uh, uh, enforcement. And when you partner with law enforcement, there might be a tendency to lean more towards enforcement than what would have been otherwise. Uh, mission creep is this idea that agencies take on more tasks than, they, than, than they, what they would have done without the partnership. Uh, that goes beyond their core mission. Um, and then organizational lag is this idea that in order for partnerships to really flourish, they need leadership support. They need uh, leadership that's going to support them and encourage them and give them the resources to participate. And there's some qualitative research that really emphasizes that if the leadership of the chief probation officer for your agency or the chief police officer isn't on board, the partnership won't flourish. It won't develop. So. It's a very important aspect. A lot of these mission distortion, mission creep can really be addressed if the partnerships are formalized and there's a very clear MOU, a memorandum of understanding that outlines the roles and responsibilities of each agency and kind of helps keep them separate, recognizes that there's differences in the mission uh, and, and ways to kind of keep that at bay. Now I have one more topic I want to address before I pass it off to Dr. Hemmons, uh, and this is the research on partnerships. When you look at and you think about evidence-based practice, um, it takes a, a certain amount of evidence before it really becomes considered evidence-based. The, the deal with police probation partnerships is they ha there hasn't been enough research to get it to the point of being evidence-based. And if you look at, for example, OJ, OJJDP's program matrix, uh, you'll find that programs like the YVRP and Nightlight, they are considered promising uh, at this point. That means that there's been some research that demonstrates they can have an impact, but there's not enough to be conclusive. Uh, so there clearly needs to be more research done. Um, and in order for that kind of research to happen, there has to be formalized partnerships, and there has to be clear goals and objectives that can be measured. Now, there's two studies I just want to highlight real briefly. Uh, one is the Boston's Operation Nightlight study that was done by Ronald Corbett, Jr. in 19, late 1990s. Uh, that one I want to highlight simply because it, it's cited the most. It's cited quite a bit in the literature. It's one of the really early studies. Um, but they did some pre-post comparisons before and after the program comparing homicide uh, rates, and they found some decreases. Uh, but they weren't able to control for any variables. Uh, outside of that. So it could have been other programs that were having a bigger influence uh, or it could be some other factors. Uh, and we know, you know, late 90s, 2000s, crime has been decreasing across the country. So when they show a decrease there in the late 90s, uh, it's not really attributable to, to, to the program or at least you don't know for sure uh, it's attributable to the program. Now a, a little stronger study came, came around a little bit later in 2006 by Whirl and Gaines and this was for San, Ber San Bernardino's nightlight program. Now, they used a more robust evaluation, uh, specifically time series and diffusion analysis. And just in a nutshell, basically what they found was a significant but weak reduction for burglary, assault, and theft 
attributed to the partnership in that jurisdiction. Now they used control cities to compare uh, as well. And they didn't find any evidence of uh, displacement or any of those kind of issues that you might suspect. Um, one interesting thing is they didn't find any impact on misdemeanors or status offenses uh, either. So clearly it's kind of more focused on the more serious crimes. Uh, but they did not look at homicide rates. Um, so before I hand it off here, one of the things I want to point out is through all this research and, and all this information about police probation and pro partnerships, um, one of the things that kind of helps us get to that formalized stage, help get to the next level, is to kind of have a better idea of really what's permissible uh, in terms of law enforcement and doing searches of probationers and police. So can they do uh, warrantless searches? Um, can, what, in what states can they do it in? And if they can't, what are the conditions that allow them to do it? Do they have to be in the presence of the probation or parole officer? Or can they do it independently? Or uh, What's the parameters around that? And that's really where Dr. Hemmons is going to help us out uh, today. And with that, I'm going to has, uh, hand it over to Dr. Hemmons. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. I'm, I'm really excited about the opportunity to share the results of our research with you. Um, as Adam has already mentioned, uh, police probation partnerships are obviously a, a, a big deal. Uh, I would say if, they are, if they're a trend, or I think they're past even being a trend, or they've become so, so commonplace. Uh, but what informs our research is this, the growth in partnerships and the Supreme Court uh, decision, which I believe Adam mentioned earlier, the case, uh, Sampson case, uh, which suggested that uh, police probation uh, partnerships might be impacted. Uh, and that police officers may be able to do warrantless searches of uh, parolees without, you know, without probable cause or reasonable suspicion. So we wanted to see really what, how have the states responded to the growth in partnerships and to this Supreme Court decision, which potentially gives police a great deal more uh, discretion than they had in the past. Uh, to start off with, of course, if we're going to talk about uh, uh, searches of probationers and parolees, we have to talk about the Fourth Amendment. Uh, everybody knows that the Fourth Amendment in general requires that uh, police officers have a search warrant uh, which is based upon probable cause before they can uh, search somebody or search their premises, search their belongings. However, the Supreme Court has created a number of exceptions to the, to the warrant requirement. Uh, these exceptions generally or usually require that the police officer have both probable cause, just as they would have to have for a, to get a warrant, and that there be some exigency or uh, exigent circumstance existing. Uh, examples of this are vehicle searches, uh, where vehicles may be searched on probable cause without a warrant because of the mobility of the vehicle, uh, and search incident to arrest, of course, where uh, when some, when a suspect is arrested, police officers do not have to obtain a search warrant to arrest them. Uh, they're allowed to search them right then because they've made the arrest. Uh, there are some other exceptions to the warrant requirement that don't involve probable cause or an exigent circumstance at all, for instance situations where police officers may obtain consent to search uh, from, from a suspect, uh, or police officers who conduct searches in what are classified as the open fields. Here, probable cause is not required, exigent circumstances not required at all. Uh, and then finally, there's a category that's usually referred to as the special needs of law enforcement. Uh, this is the category that's really most applicable to uh, searches of probationers and parolees by police officers. And for this category, the the court does not look at the existence of a warrant or non-existence, but instead relies on what they, they term reasonableness analysis. The Fourth Amendment says that searches must be reasonable. Uh, well, what exactly does that mean? And the court has, has over the past uh, century, tried to define exactly what, what reasonable means. Essentially, and I'm, I'm boiling, boiling it down a bit, whenever the court engages in reasonableness analysis, a reasonableness analysis, they balance the competing interests of the state. So in the case of probationers and parolees, what sort of expectation of privacy do they have? Or in the court's language, do they have a reasonable expectation of privacy? On the other hand, what are the interests of society in allowing these searches? And that, of course, gets to public safety, uh, as well as the rehabilitative function of, of probation and parole. Uh, when courts look at searches by uh, probation officers, parole officers, and by police officers in, the, in this context, they focus on that balancing those two issues uh, of, of public safety and rehabilitation versus the, uh, the individual, the suspect's 
or offenders' uh, privacy interests. Um, probation and parole conditions, as you all know, there are a variety, an extensive variety of probation and parole conditions. And in general, what courts have said is that any condition, uh, probation and parole condition, will be upheld so long as it is considered reasonable under the circumstances, either in general or specific to the offender, um, and if it's constitutional, if it, for instance, doesn't violate the Fourth Amendment. If, if it can be shown that a condition, like a search condition, for instance, advanced consent to search, has a rehabilitative or a public safety purpose, then courts generally uphold those as reasonable conditions. Uh, and of course, everybody, every offender who is on probation or parole has a, a lowered expectation of privacy. That's why the Fourth Amendment does not apply to them in the same way uh, that it does to free citizens. Uh, there are four Supreme Court cases that deal uh, really on point with probation and parole searches, which we've got outlined in the next slide. Uh, and these involve searches by police officers, by probation parole officers. Uh, two of them involve parolees, two of them involve probationers. So there's a bit of distinction between them. I'm sure you're, you're probably uh, familiar with, with all of them. Uh, very briefly, Griffin versus Wisconsin, uh, which was decided uh, in 1987, the Supreme Court upheld a, a state regulation, a Wisconsin state regulation, which allowed warrantless searches of probationers uh, so long as the probation officer had reasonable grounds, I, I put that term in quotes, reasonable grounds for the search. Uh, the court held that requiring a search warrant in these instances would unduly hamper the probation system. Uh, this really is an example of the court applying that special needs of law enforcement uh, approach. Uh, the next case, Pennsylvania Board of Probation and Parole versus Scott, was decided about 10 years after Griffin in 1998. And here the Supreme Court held that the exclusionary rule, which of course you all know, uh, the exclusionary rule holds that any evidence seized by the state or by the police, a violation of the Fourth Amendment would be excluded from a, a trial. Well, the Supreme Court held that the exclusionary rule does not apply to parole revocation hearings. Uh, in this case, police conducted a search which was not, not based on probable cause. They did not have a search warrant. Uh, no authorization to do it. Uh, obtained evidence that would, could have been a new, new crime for Scott, but was used at his revocation hearing. Uh, and the court allowed that. They said that applying the exclusionary rule to parole revocation hearings would turn the revocation hearing from what was supposed to be essentially a real rehabilitation focus event into a, a mini trial. Uh, so they simply held the exclusionary rule doesn't apply when two parole revocation hearings, in any cases involving police searches. Um, the next case, United States versus Knights in 2001, involved a probation condition. And this was a condition, common condition, which held that probationer gave consent in advance to any a warrantless search uh, by police officers so long as the police officer had reasonable suspicion. In other words, they couldn't do it with nothing at all, no information at all. But so long as they had at least reasonable suspicion, which is something less than probable cause, then per this, this probation condition, they could in fact uh, conduct a search. Uh, the court engaged in its standard balancing analysis uh, here and said balancing the interest in public safety and protecting the public with the lessened privacy expectation that probationers have that this was perfectly reasonable, upheld it. And then the last case, uh, Sampson versus California, which was decided in 2006, involved a state statute, California statute, which authorized police to conduct warrantless searches of parolees. The Supreme Court upheld this statute, again using reasonableness analysis and, and balancing public safety versus the privacy interests of the, uh, the offender. And this is really the case that, that opens the door, if you will, to the potential for allowing not just probation officers, but police officers to conduct warrantless searches here. Um, combine that with the, the move towards uh, partnerships between probation and parole. What we want to find out is what has happened since 2006. Have the states, in fact, listened to the Supreme Court in Sampson and said, we, we should reevaluate what we allow the police to do, uh, as well as probation officers when it comes to searching probation and parolees. Uh, next slide talks a little bit about our, our methods, how we came up with the, uh, the data that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And very simply, we did a, uh, we went on to a, a legal database, LexisNexis, uh, conducted a, a word search of all 50 state statutes uh, to find the statutes, any references to probation and parolee, 
uh, searches uh, by either probation and parole officers or by police officers, uh, trying to find the parameters, uh, what, what was allowed, what was not, were there any special circumstances, that sort of thing. Uh, we also we were able to locate all, all 50 states. A couple of them we had to call uh, directly to get some, some information. But we were able to uh, get information from all 50 states. Uh, we also examined the relevant court cases that have interpreted state statutes. Uh, as you might expect, just as the Fourth Amendment requires reasonableness, that leaves a lot to be determined what, what exactly is reasonable. Uh, state statutes also often have some vague or contradictory language, and you have to go to the, the, court, the court decisions interpreting those in order to really understand them. Uh, our findings, uh, we'll talk about those, they're displayed in the next four slides. Um, I'll start with figure one, uh, and what we try to do is color code this, so hopefully it shows up uh, pretty well on your screen. Talking first about warrantless searches allowed by probation and parole officers. At least 49 states allow probation and parole officers to conduct warrantless searches. That should come as no surprise to you. Uh, that's been the case for many, many years. Uh, some states place absolutely no restriction on uh, warrantless searches by probation and parole officers. Uh, most commonly, these uh, searches are allowed because the uh, offender has already given advanced consent as a term of his or her probation or parole. Some states do place restrictions on when probation and parole officers can conduct warrantless searches. Uh, for example, uh, Delaware requires that there be at least reasonable suspicion of criminal activity. Again, that's, that's less than probable cause, but it's, it's more than nothing. It's more than just a random decision to search. There must be some, some evidence uh, of criminal activity there. Um, in Michigan, uh, the state requires that there be at least reasonable suspicion that the offender uh, possesses something that would be a violation of their probation uh, parole condition. So contraband, drugs, alcohol, depending on what their probation parole conditions uh, outline. But in general, obviously, the overwhelming uh, number of states, virtually all states, allow uh, probation and parole officers to do, uh, to do warrantless searches in, in many, many circumstances. Uh, in Figure 2, uh, set it out in slightly different colors for you, um, we look at the states, what law enforcement officers can do. And as you see, it's color-coded differently, and I'll talk a little bit about each. Some states do allow warrantless searches by uh, probation and parole officers. Uh, excuse me, by law enforcement officers. Uh, many states do not. In fact, the majority still do not. Uh, those that do allow these warrantless searches, some do it broadly, some do it with some special conditions uh, imposed, or allow it only when probation and parole officer is also involved uh, in the search. Uh, figure 3 breaks this down a little bit more. Um, there are 35 states uh, by our study that, that do not allow warrantless searches of parishioners and parolees by police officers. So still, the overwhelming majority of states uh, have not, I guess you would say, responded to the uh, maybe the Supreme Court's invitation, that may be st too strong a term, their uh, suggestion that, that in fact warrantless searches by police officers may in, in many instances be constitutional. You have not seen states respond, quickly at least, and amend their statutes to allow this uh, by, by, uh, by police officers. Um, Eleven states do allow warrantless searches by police. Uh, those are highlighted here in blue. Uh, as you can see, they're spread, spread across the country. There's no real uh, geographic uh, concentration. We've got some on the west coast, some on the east coast, and, and a number right there in the middle of the country. Um, examples include California, uh, in fact, obviously, California was the, the California statute was the one that was at issue uh, in the Sampson case. Uh, Arkansas, uh, South Carolina, West Virginia, so quite a few. Four other states allow warrantless searches by police under certain circumstances. Um, for instance, Louisiana allows warrantless searches by police officers of sex offenders, so long as the police officer has reasonable suspicion that a criminal criminal activity has taken place. This, this authority is limited just to sex offenders, however. Uh, in North Carolina, uh, police officers, uh, and this is, comes out of a case actually, uh, are allowed to search uh, the vehicle of a parishion or parolee, but not the house. Uh, the house receives greater protection uh, under this one. Um, in Montana, 
uh, police officers may search so long as they have reasonable suspicion and the approval of a the probation or parole officer. So there is some variation there. But again, it's, if, if you look at the numbers overall, 35 states have not, have not moved to allow police officers to conduct warrantless searches as a matter of course. 15 states do allow it, 11 pretty much across the board, four with some, some serious limitations. Um, the last figure we've got, figure four, uh, kind of puts everything together here and tries to show you the search authority by state. So the states in yellow uh, are the ones which allow searches by uh, probation and parole officers. Uh, the ones in red are the ones which allow searches by probation and parole officers as well as police officers. Uh, and then the police uh, who can search only in special circumstances, those are outlined in green. So what does that tell you in general about, about what, what the, the states allow? Uh, police officers still, despite what the Supreme Court held in Sampson, uh, saying that the Fourth Amendment does not restrict uh, warrantless searches by police officers, um, and that was a case involving uh, parolees, so we're not actually sure that this would extend, the rationale would extend to a, a probation, but it's likely. Um, that, that most states have not sort of moved on that and allowed more, and enacted a statute uh, allowing police officers this, this authority, expressly allowing it. Uh, still definitely a minority of states which allow uh, police, police officers to conduct warrantless searches. Probation officers, on the other hand, as they have for a long time, still have that authority generally as a term of the probation and parole condition. Um, in conclusion, um, what does this mean for, what are the implications? Uh, for partnerships, clearly what, what this, this indicates is that uh, if police officers seek to conduct warrantless searches, uh, in most states that means they will need at the very least the cooperation of uh, probation and parole officers, those states which allow the two to work in tandem uh, and, and do that. Uh, and that may also simply require the probation and parole officer be the, the officer conducting the search rather than the, the police officer. The Supreme Court has endorsed warrantless searches of parolees. As I said, they haven't specifically addressed the uh, issue of warrantless searches of probationers, but, but I, I suspect that they would, would hold in a similar fashion. States just have not moved yet on that and have not, uh, have not, have not in, accepted or endorsed that, that approach. We still have 35 states which do not allow that. Uh, so from going forward, I think that for partnerships, uh, again, police and probation officers still have to work very much in tandem and be sure what, in their jurisdiction, what each is allowed to do. Adam, I'll, I'll turn it back to you for your concluding remarks. Thank you, uh, Dr. Hemmons, for uh, covering all the research and everything that we've done. And uh, I'll just reiterate, um, in review, I think what this really shows us is that um, there's a lot of benefit, obviously, for probation and parole and law enforcement to work together. And there's actually probably a lot more flexibility than what folks realize. Uh, obviously, uh, we don't want to abuse uh, authority or anything like that. We want to be sensible um, and use it appropriately particularly in the case of uh, higher risk uh, type of supervision cases and things of that nature. Um, I want to go ahead and move on to our Q&A session. Uh, we're doing really well on time. We're about right where we should be. So let's move on to the Q&A and gather up some questions and that'll probably help develop some dialogue. And I have uh, a variety of questions. so. Uh, Dr. Hemmons, you and I will both be open on the mic and we'll kind of just uh, take these uh, as we go. Okay, um, one question we have is, can probationers and their homes slash cars be searched without any suspicion at all, but just to ensure that they are following and abiding by the rules set by sentencing court? Um. I'll take that one, Adam. Uh, the answer is, in general, yes. In, in at least 49 states, probation officers have search authority based on, on the terms of the, of the probation agreement. And consent, advanced consent to search is, is almost always included as a probation term. Uh, if it is not included as a probation term, uh, then courts have still upheld warrantless searches by probation officers in most cases even without reasonable suspicion of probable cause, if they can demonstrate that the purpose of the search is not 
investigative in nature. In other words, if they're not looking to uh, prosecute for criminal activity, but if it is instead rehabilitative, meaning they can be looking for things that would be a violation of their the probation condition uh, and which could absolutely result in probation revocation, uh, but they're not, their purpose, their stated purpose then would be rehabilitation rather than investigation. And of course that gets to the issue that uh, probation and parole officers both have to deal with, that they have kind of a twin function, that role of providing rehabilitation and assistance to the offender, as well as providing public safety, uh, protecting the community. Great, I think you pretty much covered that as best as uh, anyone could. That's great. Um, let's see, another question we have. Uh, when police can search a probationer's home without the involvement of the probation officer, that seems to undermine the concept of collaboration. Should that be a concern to probation departments? Craig, I'll let you take the lead on these and then I'll follow. Okay, Adam, thank you. Um, I, I, I think concern is the right term for this. Uh, if you take the probation officer out of the equation, then you really are removing any sort of emphasis on rehabilitation. Uh, it, we're down to just strictly criminal investigation. I think that without having both involved, you really do uh, impact in a negative way the, the, the collaboration that's available in these kind of police uh, probation parole partnerships. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, we talked about it quite a bit, the uh, the dual roles that probation and parole officers are trying to play. And I, I can understand the concern here if law enforcement is able to go and do you know, searches independently without any input from probation. Uh, you know, that might be concerning. It it's might not be perceived as collaboration. I think that's where the uh, memorandum of understanding uh, can really play a role. You know, just because you can do something uh, doesn't mean you necessarily should or, or, um, or have to. So I think that's where the departments really have to communicate uh, effectively, line out the goals and objectives of their partnership, and stick to it, you know, really support it. Uh, so I, I think that's actually a great question that was posed. Um, we got another question here that asks, what about searching the roommate's room of a probationer? Uh, good question. Uh, the answer on that is, uh, in general, no. Uh, the, the Supreme Court has been very clear that when there are co-occupants of a residence, a house, apartment, whatever it may be, if there are clearly defined areas that belong to person A and areas that belong to person B, for instance, if they have separate bedrooms and A is in one and B is in the other, then the authority to search the offender, let's say that's person A, extends only to the, the area that the offender controls and common areas, which both people control, like the living room and the kitchen and the bathroom. But an area that, that is not controlled uh, by the offender, such as the roommate's bedroom, typically a search there would not be, would not be upheld. Okay, um, let's see, we have several questions. So. Um, here's another one. Uh, can a probation officer search the unattached buildings of the probationer's property, uh, barns, sheds, etc., without a warrant? Good question. And that gets back to, I think I mentioned the open fields exception to the Fourth Amendment uh, earlier. Uh, and open fields essentially is any area that is not part of the home. Uh, and the what is called the curtilage, which includes the area, the, the, the yard immediately surrounding the, the residence and any uh, outbuildings which have a residential component. Uh, what that means is that open fields don't have to be open or fields. Uh, they're anything that is not the curtilage. Um, unattached buildings that do not have uh, a residential component, people don't eat, sleep, live in them, are usually not considered part of the curtilage, or usually considered part of the open fields, so that police officers would not need a warrant to search those. For probation officers doing a search, I would, in most cases, I believe that the probation condition is going to authorize where a search can be done. If, if a search of a home is authorized, then I have no doubt that unattached buildings would also be included, since they have less protection even than the home. Yeah, there's actually another question that kind of follows up with that pretty closely, uh, and it asks, um, can probation officers search all common areas of a home if probationers uh, lives there as a guest? 
That's a tough question to answer. The Supreme Court has dealt with searches of residences uh, and guests, and what they came down on the side of essentially was that if the guest was an overnight guest, then a search might be permitted. If they were simply visiting temporarily, they were there to watch the ball game or have dinner or something like that, that the search was more limited. So if a probationer is in somebody else's house, I think in most, in most jurisdictions, a probation officer would not be able to conduct a search at that point because they do not have authority to search that other person's residence. The, probation, the probationer has granted consent to their search of their house and their person. However, when their person enters at somebody else's residence, then I think the courts are going to, in general, require that the probation officer have some justification for entering that residence, either it be consent uh, or a search warrant. Uh, we got a, a one question here that I think I can probably answer. Uh, it's the, does the probationer need to be present during the search? Uh, and I believe one of our earlier slides, uh, our figures, uh, maybe figure two, um, with I think it's figure two, uh, kind of displays which states require um, there be that kind of, that level of supervision by the probation officer. Uh, but in this case, I, I don't know. Uh, of course, we're asking here probationer need to be present during the search. I'll go ahead and let you take it, Craig. Right. Well, I think you're right, Adam. There are there are several states which allow police officers to conduct warrantless searches only when the probation officer is also present. That's essentially is extending the authority that the probation officer has to the police officer. And this is a little bit different point here, where if, if you're asking whether you can search the probationer's residence when the probationer is not there. I would go strictly to the terms of the probation agreement if it allows a search without their present, without them being present. Um, I have not seen court cases addressing this issue, so I'm, re I'm reluctant to say for sure one way or the other. My best guess would be that courts would be reluctant to allow the search of a premises, search of a residence, without the probationer present, simply because it would require getting access to the pre to the residence. Okay, perfect. Um, we have one question here that's kind of interesting, and it's been a topic that you know, actually has been discussed quite a bit at the Appen Institutes. Uh, it's, uh, are you aware of any case law supporting the use of searching social media, in other words, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, by probation or parole officers? Uh, Craig, I'm not sure if you might have a little bit on that, and then I can follow up with that. Oh, okay, Adam. Uh, I'm going to start off by saying, no, I'm not. I have not seen any case law. I don't know if you have, Adam. I will, and this is just... Ten, just a little bit of a tangent, many of you may have heard the Supreme Court yesterday just struck down in a unanimous decision, which I think a lot surprised a lot of people, uh, warrantless searches of cell phones that had been seized by the police uh, in two cases, uh, Wiley and Murray. Uh, Riley came out of California and Murray, I think, was a, a U.S. Uh, district court case. Uh, and the Supreme Court there indicated that, that the advances in technology, things like cell phones, and this would apply, I think, uh, to social media, Twitter, that kind of thing, that, that people do have an expectation of privacy there. Now that again dealt with police officers, not probation parole officers, and typically probation parole officers are granted much more leeway to search social media. So I don't know where the courts would go on that, but but that Supreme Court case at least suggests that, that it's not wide open. Yeah, I think uh, that's a great point. It's great that you just mentioned that case. Um, and I also want to throw in, you know, the uh, APPA Technology Committee has been working up some guidance on this very uh, notion. Uh, I'm not aware of any case law either that's come up. I'm, I'm sure it's coming in the future. Uh, we do know probation and parole uh, agencies are doing different types of you know, covert sort of monitoring of social media or requiring passwords. Um, and there are some uh, iffy areas, particularly when you're uh, going on pretending to be someone else and you know, befriending a probation or a parolee. Um, there's some issues there. There's also issues if you, maybe you witness uh, someone else maybe in a photo on their profile that's not the probationer but that's committing some sort of offense. Uh, there's really kind of not a lot of guidance there on what can happen. You know, is it, uh, so I would say stay tuned. The technology committee uh, is working on that topic. They're, they are going to be providing some uh, guidance in the future. So uh, we'll definitely come back to that. 
That's a fascinating topic, by the way. You've just given me a, a really great research topic for another paper, so thank you. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'm going to search for a few more questions. There's quite a bit, so um, let's see. Uh, okay, there's a question. This is more of an administrative question, actually, but uh, individuals asking if there's a certificate available for uh, people who participate in the webinar. Uh, we do have a, a, um, a uh, it's basically like a certificate. If you just want to email us, uh, my contact info will be displayed a little later. You can email us and we will, um, we will get you that paper. That's fine. Okay, this is a question that builds off of the Supreme Court case you just mentioned about cell phones. Uh, in light of that Supreme Court decision yesterday, does this impact or limit probation access to cell phone searches? Uh, I think it, um, it's not really clear, if, I, if I'm understanding correctly. I, I think you're absolutely right, Adam. This, the, the cell phone case did involve police searches rather than probation for officer searches, and, and the court has shown much more willingness to allow police, uh, excuse me, probation and parole officers uh, uh, the discretion to conduct warrantless searches than it has police, even with regard to any kind of technology or anything. So I'm not sure that, that restricting the police as much as the court did yesterday will apply in the same, same way to probation and parole officers. But it's definitely a, a heads up, I think, for everybody that we need to, this is an issue that needs to be addressed and probably needs to be, be clarified by the lower courts. Yeah, in fact, uh, a lot of people have asked the same question repeatedly, so it's a hot topic <laughs> right now. Uh, um, let's see. Uh, this is kind of an interesting question. Do states consistently have search procedures in place for probation and police? Well, based on what we've seen in looking at the statutes, and this again didn't look at uh, what individual jurisdictions within the state may do, they may well have policy. They do have, I'm sure, policies, procedures in, in many instances. But in terms of within the statutes, uh, most states simply say, do not allow police to conduct searches. Again, I believe it's 35 states that still have a blanket uh, prohibition on that. Those states which do allow the searches, uh, some of them allow it broadly, generally, uh, and a few have some special circumstances, such as Louisiana limiting the searches only to, uh, to sex offenders, for instance. Uh, but again, at the local level, I'm sure there are policies and procedures that, that govern this perhaps more specifically. And if they're not, that's something I think everybody would want to uh, address in their agency to get as much clarity as possible. Uh, another question we have, can law enforcement help a probation officer with the search of a person or residence of the person or on probation? That was an easy one, absolutely. Absolutely, the courts have generally upheld the police, uh, upheld police assisting in the search. When you get into a bit of an issue for, uh, for courts is when it appears that the police officer is, has asked the probation or parole officer to conduct the search for purposes that the police officer has, and that gets into the, the stalking horse situation that, that Adam mentioned earlier. But in terms of simply requesting assistance uh, from the police in conducting the search, absolutely, courts have no problem with that. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm seeing some questions that are asking about sources uh, for some of the uh, states and then also uh, there's a question about uh, improving officer safety and et cetera. And I can kind of comment, if uh, for those who are kind of interested in the sources for anything in terms of safety uh, and those kind of things, I did mention a lot of that's anecdotal. That means it's based on you know, a small number of uh, articles and studies, and I'm more than happy to share all those sources with you. I can share a full reference sheet. Um, so again, feel free to, to email us afterwards, and we'll be happy to provide you a uh, full reference. You can also go onto the APPA PSN website. Uh, we have a lot of articles there that, you know, that basically support everything that's been said in this webinar. So more than happy to, to help you with that. And then uh, also, Craig, you can provide any of the, um, you know, you have a whole list. We have an article that's uh, uh, been submitted that has the statute and everything that supports the uh, tables and figures that were presented. 
That's correct. That that article, once it once it appears in print, will I think be useful because it includes uh, obviously each state, uh, the statutory and case law citation. Uh, so if folks are interested in comparing uh, what other jurisdictions do, it'll be very easy as a reference for them to, to do that. Now, if if folks are interested in that manuscript, um, is that are we going to be okay to share that with folks? Uh, it's certainly okay with me. I think that since it's it's currently under submission, we have to wait until there's been a publication decision made. But at that point, I'm I'm happy to share it with folks, and I think my contact information uh, is at at the end. I'm happy to share something by email. Okay. Okay. I, I think we're kind of at the end of our time, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, run through a few more slides, and then we'll conclude. Uh, for those that we weren't able to get to your questions, feel free to follow up with us, and we'll do our best to uh, answer them. Uh, a, a few more closing uh, slides we have here. I want to obviously encourage everybody to you know, visit the APPA website. Uh, there is the pretrial probation and parole supervision week in, in the middle of July. And then there's also the uh, Institute in New Orleans. Uh, we will be presenting a workshop on this topic at the Institute. Uh, so if you're going to be there, there's another opportunity to field some more questions, get some more questions answered. Uh, in addition, I will be doing a work group uh, meeting uh, concerning police and probation and pro partnerships uh, as it pertains to some of my dissertation work. So I would encourage folks to uh, uh, help me out and, and join that meeting if you're going to be there. I'd really appreciate it. Uh, another slide here I want to share. We do have a, a website dedicated to Project Safe Neighborhoods uh, by APPA. It includes all the products that we create, all the trainings, webinars, publications. I would encourage you to visit that website. Utilize everything on there that you can you can find. And if you have any questions or need any other information, just let us know. And then I want to conclude our presentation. Uh, my contact information is here. I'm happy to field uh, questions on to Craig and John as needed. And then I also want to give a special thanks to Darling Webb and Lisa Ginner who have been helping out kind of behind the scenes on this webinar. And then also I want to thank BJA for support and the APPA membership for their continued support as well. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.